if this was to be a welcoming mechanism, after 30 years, um, did it work? Um, it worked for the people that it worked, which is a minority. Um, the reason that we know that it worked for them is that new studies like the New York 2011 study asked people the question, do you feel comfortable when you go to a synagogue or temple? And overwhelmingly, even those people who hardly ever go to a synagogue or temple, those intermarried families, said that they don't feel uncomfortable. They are never made to feel that they are uncomfortable. They're always welcomed in. So to the extent that telling an intermarried man that his children could not be accepted in the congregation, um, that that was changed, that has worked, that people don't feel, intermarried families don't feel uncomfortable. However, if the goal was to produce the next generation of Jews, then it hasn't worked. Um, so it worked for the ostensible goal, but it did not work for the true underlying goal. How much awareness is there of this gender difference in, uh, um, I mean, is this something that's come out in recent research or is this something that's wildly, wildly known and known by policymakers? Well, I think the JPPI did a very, very important thing in the annual assessment um, in publishing and documenting information about this. There has been some prior research, but as you can imagine, it's a politically incorrect message. Um, it's a politically incorrect message because it's saying, hey, we may aim for gender equality, but men and women just aren't behaving in the same way. If we wanted to encourage greater participation uh, on the part of males and part of men, then we will be bucking an overall um, um, cultural trend in the United States. Yes, well, Jews have never been averse to being countercultural, so I would say that this is an example of an area which really needs um, American Jewish attention. It needs attention educationally, it needs um, attention in terms of strategies for attracting teenagers and young adults. Um, we need to be aware of it. It's not helpful not to be aware that we're bucking a culture-wide trend, but we need to think of how we can help to counter that culture-wide trend. I think we need research on what is attractive to Jews, I would say starting from the teen years. We have, leading up into bar and bat mitzvah in the United States, um, a kind of captive audience. So kids are typically in a Jewish educational setting um, up through their 13th year. But starting from the 13th year onward, we need research looking at what is attractive to teenage Jewish boys in terms of educational activities, in terms of social activities. One example of a strategy which has been helpful in some places is uh, philanthropy. Um, tzedek clubs in which boys are given a certain amount of money to distribute philanthropically and a certain amount of money to invest. That's the hook. If I'm not mistaken, if I understood correctly the statements of the reform leadership at the time, including Alexander Schindler and other people, and Eric Jaffa, I don't think that they intended patrilineal descent to preclude the conversion of the non-Jewish spouse. That is right, and I think that goes to the law of unintended consequences. Um, what happened in congregations was that when um, inclus inclusiveness became the buzzword. To be inclusive was the, the highest Jewish value. Um, when being welcoming became the great motivation, what happened was that if a rabbi mentioned conversion, the intermarried families sometimes said that made them feel like they weren't welcome. And so in an attempt to make the intermarried families at all, in, in all situations feel completely equal and completely welcome in the congregation, many rabbis started soft-peddling 
any attempts towards conversion. And then that became the norm. We went through a tipping point, and that became the norm. And many rabbis expressed to me the idea that um, it, it stirs up a hornet's nest um, when one starts pushing for conversion as a strategy. But I also understood that, that conversionary families in terms of uh, participation rates, both in Jewish religious and in Jewish communal activities and functions, are very similar to um, to born Jews, um, um, and hence um, I think that the Jewish it would seem from that that the Jewish people would have a policy interest in conversion. Yes, they should have a policy interest in conversion. Um, but the truth is that we, in the most current research, we're often not even getting information about conversionary households. Why? Because on ideological grounds. The researchers, probably encouraged by the communities that they're doing research for, don't separate out the conversionary families from the inborn families. We used to have very reliable information about conversionary families because our, our studies asked those questions and then computed them on that basis. But now, in much of the brand new research, Conversionary families are counted, they're computed, as in married families. So if they're having special issues, we don't even know about it because we want so much, this sort of goes with the inclusiveness thing, we want so much to show that once you convert, you're just like everybody else, that we don't even have the information in the most recent studies as to whether they're well, we having special challenges.